एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर खुशबू कलानी फ्राम डेंटो ऑसम टूडे आई हैव कम अप विद द टॉपिक डिफेंस मैकेनिजम्स ऑफ जंजाइवा दिस कम्स अंडर जंजाइवल डिजीजेज एंड वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट वन सो टू इंट्रोड्यूस यू अबाउट दिस वट आर वी गोइंग टू एक्चुअली स्टडी सो योर जंजाइवा इन द ओरल कैविटी एट टाइम्स इज सब्जेक्टेड टू बैक्टीरियल और मैकेनिकल और ट्रमेटिक अटैक्स ओके प्रॉबली यू वुड से इट इज अटैक्ड बाई दी बैक्टीरिया ऑल द टाइम सो ना वॉट आर द एलिमेंट्स इन योर ओरल कैविटी इट सेल्फ विच आर गोइंग टू फाइट बैक विच आर गोइंग टू रिस्पॉन्ड सो दोज आर योर सलाइवा द वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट वन एपिथीलियल सर्फिस एंड इफ थिंग्स गो बियॉन्ड नॉर्मल beyond a certain extent then the inflammatory processes will take place and this actually is a clinical term but it would provide resistance it's a resistance providing mechanism as we have studied in the pathology already what are we going to study in this topic what are we going to see we are going to see about two major things the circular fluid and the saliva the under circular circular fluid what is circular fluid it's nothing but your gingival cravicular fluid gcf so we are going to see the methods of collection the composition and the clinical significance and under saliva we are we are going to see the role of saliva its antibacterial factors the antibodies the buffers and coagulation factors we are going to see the leukocytes that are present in saliva and its role in the periodontal pathology now to begin with the circular fluids its methods of collection first question arises why do we need to collect it why do we need gcf so it's actually a diagnostic method we need to find out which bacteria or which microbe is causing the disease for example aggressive periodontitis is caused by a a comatans how do we come to know that we come to know it by collecting gcf or you can also use it for any research purposes to conduct any studies there are actually four methods to collect this okay those are absorbing paper strips number 1 the second one is twisted thread method the third as third method is by using micro pipettes and the fourth is intraclavicular washing so absorbing paper strips what are we going to do there are two methods intracellular and extracellular as we can understand by the name we are going to place the strip into the sulcus so what do we do in the intracellular method we put the strip deep into the pocket until the resistance is felt once the resistance is felt the fluid the epithelium the circular epithelium will get triggered and the fluid will come up will flow and it will be absorbed on the paper strip but this method causes irritation generally your pathologically compromised gingiva has ulcerated inner epithelium so it's painful if the strip comes in contact with the pocket wall in our lining of the pocket wall so we need to minimize this okay so what low and holm pedersen did was they placed the strip just at the entrance of the pocket in this way the fluid will also seep out and it the paper will not come in contact with the epithelium now this is the this is the first method the second method is the twisted thread method it's a very simple method the twisted threads are wound up circumferentially onto the neck or the cravicular area of the tooth and the fluid is collected then it is estimated by weighing those threads the third method is the micropipette method the use of micropipette permits the collection through capillarity action through the through the principle of capillarity the capillary tubes are placed in the pockets the capillary tubes are of standard length and diameter and the content is then later centrifuged and analyzed the fourth 
method is the crevicular washing. This method is used for clinically normal gingiva. Okay. One method involves use of an appliance that consists of a hard acrylic plate that covers the maxilla with the borders and the grooves following the gingival margin. It is connected to the four tubes. The washings are obtained by rinsing the crevicular areas from one side to the other. That's why the crevicular washing. Okay. And how do you um, rinse this by using a peristaltic pump? So that's about intracrevicular washing and that's about methods of collection. So this is the device, an electronic device which measures the amount of fluid collected by the filter paper method and uh, it's actually the GACF collected is very very small. The strip which we inserted is 1.5 mm wide and uh, if when we inserted just 1 mm into the sulcus which is inflamed, slightly inflamed, it collects about 0.1 mg of GCF in 3 minutes. Now what are the components of sulcular fluid? The components of GCF are very specific. Uh, they are characterized according to the individual proteins, the specific antigens, antibodies, enzymes, and there are tons of other specificities. There are 40 compounds which have been analyzed, and there are 80 compounds which are there, which we know are there, but we do not know about the origin yet, which are beta glucuronidases, lactic acid dehydrogenase, collagenases phospholipases these are few of the compounds that we know are there but we do not know the origin from where does it come into the gcf and there are other sub other um, components like pmns which we all know will be will be there and other than that there are some non enzymatic substances like cellular elements electrolytes and organic compounds the cellular elements are bacteria, desquamated epithelial cells, leukocytes, macrophages, and electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium. Um, there's also a correlation which has been studied that the calcium and sodium concentrations versus the sodium and potassium ratio which, in, which is found during the inflammation. Then there are organic compounds like glucohexosamine, um, hexuronic acid and uh, um, the total pro protein content of GCS is much, GCF is much less than that of the serum. Then there are bacterial and um, bacterial products and metabolic products, the uric acid, hydroxyproline, endotoxins etc. The methodology that is used for the analysis of these components is varied. How do we know that these are the components? How, how have we found all of these things? There are methods. So fluorometry, even this is very specific. Now if you want, if for the detection of uh, metalloproteins, you use fluorometry. ELISA for the detection of enzymatic levels and interleukins, radioimmune assays, etc. Okay. You just need to remember few of the names. That's enough. Now, what is the clinical significance of circular fluid? GCF is an inflammatory exudate. Okay. GCF is actually an indication that the uh, inflammation or the inflammatory process has begun. Okay. So, the because the amount of GCF is certainly greater when the inflammation is present. Sometimes it is also correlated, also connected with the severity of the inflammation. And uh, it's one thing to notice, it's not increased during trauma, of, uh, trauma from occlusion. It is certainly increased when you masticate a coarse food, where, during toothbrushing or gingival massage, uh, ov during ovulation and uh, by uh, by smoking, by wearing a prosthetic appliance, etc. There are other factors which are circadian periodicity, 
that is the amount of gcf increases from 6 am to 10 pm and then it will decrease the sex hormones female sex hormone increase the gcf flow it also um, increases the or enhances the vascular perme- permeability during pregnancy ovulation or under uh, hormonal contraceptives the gcf flow will certainly increase then mechanical stimulation by chewing or uh, vigorous brushing uh, as we have noted before as we've seen before that even the place by the placement of the paper strip the production of the fluid increases then smoking will produce an immediate increase in the gcf flow and the periodontal therapy during the healing period after the periodontal surgery there will be an increase in gcf these this is the clinical significance now before coming to saliva i hope all the things that you need to know about the circular fluid is clear then comes saliva now the saliva has a major role and a major influence it has a major role on in initiation maturation and metabolism but it has a major influence on bacterial activity in general by uh, on the acids produced by bacteria it buffers it and on the plaque by mechanically cleaning the exposed surfaces to see the composition it has got an inorganic and organic component inorganic components like cations and anions cations sodium potassium calcium anions chlorine bicarbonates phosphates and thiocyanates and um, organic gamma globulins like tyalin mucin igg lysosome bradykinin vitamin k uh, vitamin k and c growth factors uric acid cellular components etc now this is important the basic thing the basic antibacterial factor of the saliva which is of our concern in this chapter there are four major factors lysosome myeloperoxidase lactoperoxidase thiocyanate and glycoproteins and mucins so lysosome we all know it's an hydrolytic enzyme which will cleave the linkage which is the beta 1 4 glycosidic bond of peptidoglycans peptidoglycans which is a component of bacterial cell wall so example actinobacillus actinomycetum comitans then myeloperoxidase this is an enzyme which is released by the leukocyte it is bactericidal for actinobacillus then lactoperoxidase thiocyanase lacto the name suggests that it will be bactericidal to the strains of lactobacillus and streptococcus how it will prevent the accumulation of lysine and glutamic acid which are essential for the bacterial growth and the fourth is the glycoprotein and mucin it will form a coating over the tissue structures and will provide lubrication and will provide the physical protection it's like making an acquired pellicle to the bacterial attack to which the bacterial attach next the salivary antibodies saliva contains iga predominantly saliva you see there is no g in that okay there is a in it for sure there is no m in that so by that you can remember that the iga is predominant in saliva then uh, it's majorly der- derived from the plasma and cells of salivary glands which is parotid gland obviously IgA is important in maintaining the homeostasis in the oral cavity. It may control the oral microbiota by reducing the adherence of bacterial cells to the mucosa and the teeth. It will not let the bacterial cells to adhere to the mucosa or the teeth. That's so it's very important according to me. Then IgG. Uh this is derived from serum via GCF and it's present in low concentrations. and igg concentration in such saliva increases during inflammation of the periodontal tissue and it becomes more severe as the vascular permeability increases so more the gcf flow more will be the igg because from there it is derived right 
so these are the antibodies found in salivary in the saliva so the salivary buffers and the coagulation factors salivary buffers are the bicarbonates carbonic acid system which maintains the physiologic ph of the oral cavity and uh, it also contains the coagul coagulation factor 8 9 10 pt and hagman factor that hastens the blood coagulation and protects the wounds from bacterial invasion this particular factor pta and hagman will accelerate the coagulation of blood and will thus protect the wound from the invasion by the bacteria leukocytes they reach the oral cavity migrating through the gingival sulcus pmns are chiefly found in saliva it mainly causes the phagocytosis of bacteria the li the living pmns in the saliva are called as organulocytes and their migratory rate is termed as organulocytic migratory rate the investigators have correlated this with the inflammation the severity of gingival inflammation and therefore it's a reliable index for assessing the gingivitis these are my references thank you if you have any queries feel free to ask